Signalis is a game that creates many questions when you finish it, and for some of us, we attempted to shuttle together pieces of evidence to craft theories that could possibly explain away the confusion. I'm included in that group, as months ago, when I first immersed myself within the brain knot that is this game, I found a conclusion that made sense from the experience that I had just played, and I still think that conclusion holds ground, and I'm happy to see that many people had the pleasure of enjoying my explanations as well. But time has passed, and theories have had time to expand, as well as Rose Engine has had time to commentate on their views of all of our search for the truth. And there is one comment by Rose Engine that has directly spawned this video. The statement is that all endings are good endings. They said this in response to people pushing to get promise or artifact in the desire to get the true ending. But the statement could finally offer the keys to truly gaining an understanding of these endings that is greater than just the headcanons of interpretation. So with no more delay, let's just get right into trying to finally explain what exactly occurs at the end of Signalis. <laughs> to begin, let's quickly review the endings. Signalis has four main endings, these being Memory, Weave, Promise, and Lily. Aside from these endings, there's also the fakeout ending, which if you're someone whose last vision of Signalis was Elster's dead eye in the main screen, then you should be aware that you did not finish the game, and probably should load back into your save file and play the final part out. So what happens in the main four endings? Well, in memory, Elster approaches Ariana final time, but yet cannot bring herself to enact the promise. In Weave, Elster remembers the promise and decides to run away from even attempting to enact it, and in promise, Elster kills Arianne as per the details of their promise. The final secret ending is the Lily ending, and I will return to this ending later as it is the most unique of the four. But in this moment, I'd like to remind of something I said in my opening. In Rose Engine's opinion, all of these endings are supposed to be seen as equals, and rather just true endings that are reflective of playstyle. If this is the case, then why does it seem as though the promise ending is the closest to a true and real ending that the game has? seeing as it is the only one out of the three where the promise is enacted. Or how could Weave possibly be a good ending when it is simply Elster running away? It is here we must consider another theme in Signalis, the concept that one must observe the entire pattern or configuration rather than its individual parts. So rather than thinking about the three endings in isolation, what if we considered them together? And to do such, we must back up and consider how we got to them. And to do that, we must consider the first death of Elster that we see in the game, the fakeout ending, and why it symbolizes an end of a cycle. For those who didn't read all the notes or understand all the dialogue, one thing that needs to be understood is that the events of S23 all occur within a cycle, be it Elster dying from the elevator, Adler fighting Issa, or any other event that occurred within S23. This concept of the cycle is what Adler is complaining about to us in all of his dialogue, his belief that the cycle is infinite, and that Elster is only a proponent of that cycle. But during the events of the game, something is different. Elster doesn't die from the fall in the elevator, and most importantly, after dying at the end of nowhere from the wound she sustained and the fake ending playing, Elster comes back. Elster, unlike all of her previous versions, continues her journey, and this time is determined to finish it. Meaning for once, she's broken the cycle and the results of this we can immediately see when we return to re-education. In this version of the cycle, everything is wrong. No longer is this location the same that we saw in the beginning of the game when we started at S23, but rather it is a location that is clearly distorted by flesh. It has changed. Something Elster did changed the cycle that refused to change, and this time, something is different. This is important as the concept that this cycle is different than all the prior matters, as it means that this cycle is the first that Elster goes to Rotfront, and by that line of reasoning means it's the first time that Elster ever got back to the code room. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that this cycle is different? Well, it means that finality is possible. It means the cycle is no longer endless, but rather it has finally been broken. The most literal example we get in the game of proof that the cycle is over is from the unsealed king in yellow that we find in the code room, a proof that we have crossed a threshold previously uncrossed, and in doing so, face the true might of the book. And sure enough, we do face the book's true might. 
a super soldier that has been overwritten by the distortion and memories of someone she never met. And even with this warrior designed for victory, the book cannot defeat Alster. So it does the next best thing, make sure she goes down with it. We can see this from Ador, someone who a deeper theorist or theory could easily connect to being a representative of the will of the king in yellow. It is this man who ultimately fells Elster, but he does so in a pathetic gesture, not in a grand, powerful display, but rather of weakly throwing a knife into her eye, before being blasted, slain, and discarded. In fact, by reading Adler's lines, we can support this theory even more. He tells her that her actions will destroy everything, alluding that if Elster continues from here, if she passes the gate and firmly ends the cycle, then this reality that he has constructed will be no more. Yet in the end, Elster does not care, for she is, as he says, a selfish bastard who only wants to put the dream to rest and doesn't care about the things within the dream. The king is lost and his distortion and pain shall now end, but his infection isn't done yet, for there still lies one person who has read from his tome that lives, and that person is Elster. She now is the only being left upholding this reality. Yet, she is mortally wounded herself. So it is from here that we can revisit what these endings truly mean. For these endings aren't really endings, as by the point that Elster has been stabbed by Adler, the end has already been determined. Elster will die, and reality will end. Rather, these endings are more akin to what Rose Engine described them as, reflections of how the player, or Elster, played the game. These endings are simply the last moments of a dying woman who has gained complete control over the reality that she is in and is using that control to grant herself the death she desires or believes that she deserves. This form and this type of death is different depending on the ending, but with this interpretation, all endings can be equally good. Let me explain. Starting off with Weave, the most classically bad ending. In this ending, Elster seemingly runs away from the promise, having lacked the will to enact it. And out of the guilt that she feels from herself, dies alone. So she doesn't face the icon of her guilt, rather chooses to die alone. But she doesn't truly die alone. Rather, in her final moment, she is brought back to a land defined by water, a land of great seas, Vignetia. This planet was once the homeworld of humanity. It's her homeworld and was a place airy and her longed to see once more. Weave is the ending that requires speed and low enemy engagement, and it is a perfect reflection of this. If the player didn't want to kill, then how could they bring themselves to kill Arion? Instead of pushing the player that they should have, they rather let Elster find rest amongst the waters she knew so well, and his truly happy ending allowing the tired soul to finally find rest and comfort in her home which is the most familiar thing to her. Next is memory. It is in this ending that requires a large amount of dialogue, yet quicker clear time, that we see Elster enter the room of Arion. Yet, again, she finds herself unable to enact the promise, and in her dying state asks only to rest alongside her lover, who has long forgotten her lost promise. To obtain memory requires large amounts of conversation with the various characters of the game, as well as spending large amounts of time in the memory sequence of the game, as well on top of those two things, having a medium clear time. The player who did these things clearly cared about every detail occurring, and decided to spend as much time as they could in the happiest part of Elster's life, the memory sequence. By understanding this, it is needed to be understood that if we think the happiest sequence of her life was memory, then how could we bring ourselves or bring Elster to kill the lover that represents this? So, her memory allows her, from her great knowledge, to see her lover one last time, something she wants from having talked to countless other people and heard their own tales of foregone love. So this love ending manifests as an ending where her lover will not force her to kill her, but rather just Elster gets to rest alongside her and gets to see her lover one last time. And to me, that is a happy ending. Finally, we have Promise, the ending that requires massive playtime and massive kill count. In this ending, Elster enacts the promise, the promise being to put her lover out of her misery. The promise likely resulted from long before the events of the game, a simple desire from Arion to kill her before she suffered from the cancer and radiation, a desire that sadly Elster failed to help with, 
is ultimately from, as I said earlier, Elster died long ago, and before Arion could. This ending is too a result of the player. The Elster of the Promise ending has clearly chosen throughout the entire game that death is a preferable outcome to suffering, and due to it, values the promise far more than the other two endings value it. This massive playtime could represent Elster having longer to build up the guilt of the failure of the promise, and thus makes it so when she is ultimately given the option, she manifests an ending where her lover is okay with this decision, so she can finally write what in her mind was a wrong that she committed so long ago. So to review what I'm saying here, all three of the normal endings are simply manifestations of the playstyle, being shown before Elster as a conclusion to her journey, to allow her to rest in peace that is based off of what that version of Elster would find as peace. And following her death, the realm is destroyed along with the cycle, ending the pain and suffering of everyone involved. However, there is still another ending that needs to be considered, and that is the artifact ending. This secret ending works in a way quite different than the previous three, and as of such to understand it, I believe the best part is to start with reviewing how we can acquire this secret ending. First, we are going to need some codes. These codes are the same numbers that flash on the screen following the first reading of the King in Yellow, likely representing that whatever happens in this ending is related to having a high level of control over the power the book bestows, as by using the wisdom or numbers the king grants us, we attempt to control his power for our benefit. Next, we have the keys. To get this ending, one will need three different keys. These are the key of sacrifice, the key of love, and the key of eternity. These keys, to me, each represent one part of the symbolism behind what this ending means. First is the love. This symbolizes a manifestation of Elster's love for Arianne. She loves her so much that she is unable to complete the promise, and would rather just be with her. Next is eternity. This suggests and contextualizes what is exactly being done by this ritual. Elster is creating a new cycle or a new moment of eternity, but one that allows her to be with Arion forever. Finally, sacrifice. She is sacrificing our main cast, either literally using their souls and existence to fuel her creation, or figuratively by stating that they are doomed to suffer within the cycle forever while she escapes. In addition to this, we must also remember that the three keys are also relative to the three seals we see in Nowhere, meaning they represent a part of the ideals of the King in Yellow. Next, let's consider where the safe is. The safe is located within Arion's room, right behind the desk she used to use, and where the King in Yellow rests. The safe is something dear to Arion, and by accessing it, it could represent doing an action that is closer to the heart and soul of what Arion believes. If anything, the usage of the code reinforces that Elster is a better and more experienced user of the abilities of the book, and as of such is simply mimicking the exact same process that Ariane subconsciously did on her death. Continuing with this ending, we have the lily, the item you get when you open the safe. The lily as a flower represents purity, but in this case it seems to instead symbolize the symbol for lesbian love, with its name in the files even being Yuri showcasing how this is the result when Elster's love for Arianne is too strong to allow her to fulfill the promise. But there's more to cover. The ritual showcased pillars that strongly resemble the graves in nowhere, reinforcing that the sacrifice that Elster makes here is at the cost of the souls of the rest of the cast. An empty grave can be seen in the center, representing where Arianne should lie, but that she, Elster, is sacrificing these other souls to prevent that action. It should also be noted that when this ritual is seen, we've seen it before in the game, though due to it flashing quickly on the screen, it was easy to miss. This moment where we saw it in the past was during the fake out ending. It's named Grabber in the files, which means grave, and implies that this process has likely happened before, most likely by Arianne. Then we get to the artifact. This is the artifact that appears in the game's logo and should be seen as a physical item that is used to create the cycles both for Arion in the main cycle, and now Elster in this ending. In the files, this object is called a Tesseract, which is a cube in the fourth dimension, reinforcing that this is the item that has caused the distortion of not just reality, but time itself. Regardless, following the depiction of this item, we see the Penrose landing on a planet. The dream that the two pilots long dreamed would end. Their pointless adventure into space came into reality. However, the pan-up reveals they are still being observed. This is likely the King in Yellow, 
who has granted them the happiness within his story, and it is through the use of his powers that they are able to create this new dream. All of this leads us to the conclusion of the Lily ending, the last waltz between our main lovers. Originally, I adopted a cynical approach to this, believing it was something negative. However, by looking at Rose Engine's comment, I realized I was wrong. This waltz is exactly what we see. Elster is using her powers as a reader of the key in yellow to finally live out the dream of happiness her and Arion wanted, granting these two lovers the dance they both wanted so much, at the cost of the cycle never being destroyed and the king never being stopped. So the main endings represent finality and a good ending through the end of the pain, while the lily ending represents eternity and a good ending through the granting the main pair the finale they both deserved. In this aspect, all of the endings are good, in their own ways, true, and both should be seen as equals. And really it's up to interpretation which of the four you view as the greatest possible ending for Elster. And I feel like that's how Rose Engine intended it to be. So that covers the main four endings. However, there is one more thing I'd like to cover in this video, and it pertains to a comment made by Yuri. Yuri being one of the two devs of Rose Engine. This comment is that the fake out ending should have been seen as a proper ending in its own right. That if somebody wanted to walk away there, they could have. This is a perplexing statement to me, as the last leg of the game is where so many questions finally get answered, and in my mind, is integral to really understanding the game. So how could this be possible? One way to look at it is that prior to the fake out ending, we can see the events of one complete cycle and that everything we see prior to this ending is what would have been looping over and over again at S23. In this way, the ending holds importance and is proper in that due to the nature of the cycle, we can assume that the next step would just be restarting. But honestly, this answer doesn't really do it for me. So instead, let's consider what is finality by the end of the fake out ending. The obvious answer is Elster. Elster passes the king's seals and enters eternity where she is wounded by Falk before dying. But this death isn't really proper, is it? Well, it can be. If we consider this as an act of finality, it represents just another cog in the cycle, and in that way, this ending does in fact have meaning. It represents true hopelessness and despair, a representation that Elster was doomed from the moment she didn't listen to the star at the start of the game. The meaning of the first half of the game is to display the sheer lack of power Elster holds against not just the Eldritch Nightmares, but also the very society of the Yusan Nation, as it is directly demonstrated by her being killed by the very pinnacle of the nation, Falk. Whilst this ending certainly isn't the best, it does offer finality on a story based on a difficult struggle against an unstoppable force, which honestly is a very important, dominating theme throughout Signals. So, in that way, it can be seen as a true ending. In the end, these are all just explanations that make sense to me. I hope you enjoyed them, and hopefully this helps us all understand this gem of a game that much more. If you enjoyed this video and like to talk to others about Signalis lore, mods, theories, or other people in general, a link to my Discord, VSL, is in my description. Thank you to Mr. Skelly for supporting my membership. Your actions help fund videos like this. And until next time, this has been Christopher Beast. Ciao.